Hello everyone and welcome to The Loft. My name is Wesley Garcia, Director of Loft Connections, and my pronouns are he, him. And my name is Julia Black, and I am the Director of Worship, and my pronouns are she, her. The Loft is a conversation-based community, and that means that we believe that conversation and open dialogue with one another is the best way to connect more deeply with our faith and the divine. We're also an inclusive and affirming community that welcomes all people from all walks of life. But we do a special invitation to the LGBTQ plus community. You are welcome here. You are supported here. You are included here. We gather together every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. But we are not just Sunday friends. We also get together multiple times throughout the week. So if you have any interest in joining us or if you have any questions, please reach out. We can be found at theloftla.org. Thanks for tuning in. Come be a part of the conversation. Standing up from crags and clay, the peaks of earth in full display. They break the lines that break the sky, that's full of light, full of light. of creation's dance, the tapestry, the symphony of life himself, of love herself, is written in all very skin. Soil is spilling life to life. Stars are born to fill the night. The ocean score in majesty of sculpted shore. Mystery of
fearfully and wonderfully and beautifully made. The Serenity Prayer by Reinhold Niebuhr God, give us grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed, courage to change the things which should be changed, and the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking, as Jesus did, the sinful world as it is, not as we would have it, trusting that you will make all things right. If we surrender to your will so that we may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Mark 5, 25 through 34. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Uh, so, Becca Barron, so glad that you could join us for our conversation today. Uh, grateful to have you with us. Um, as you and I were reflecting this week, there's, there's, there's this is uh, sense that, like, right now, no one really knows what's going on, and we're all trying to figure ourselves out. And part of this Spirit Plus Care series is really trying to dig into that and pull in some resources that can help us kind of process that through our faith. Um, but one of the things that was most encouraging in the midst of that was you sharing that even folks in the mental health profession are still trying to figure out what to do in this time. And, and that, that was remarkably refreshing for me. Uh, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that we all share this kind of sense of, um, I think I told you before, I feel like everybody, whether it's in your parenting and Zoom schooling or, or reimagining your career, we're all kind of building the plane in the air. <laughs> and mental health professionals are no different. Um, there's a lot of um, sort of hand wringing and, and staying up late at night talking to your colleagues, trying to figure out what the best ways to approach not only um, clients and um, traditional mental health care, but also like our own families and our own self care. Um, and, you know, just for a little bit of background, I, I went to graduate school for um, depth psychology at Pacifica, which is a very specific kind of psychology, and I did not go on to do my licensure. Um, because I decided to work sort of outside the system because that makes different modalities of work that are not currently um, approved of by the California Board of Behavioral Sciences open to me, um, including psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, which is a focus. But um, in both of my communities, the more sort of what I would consider to be shamanic ceremonial ancestral healing community and in my very clinical, you know, my, my neuroscientist friends who work at UCLA, we're all doing the same thing, which is kind of looking to each other for solutions that we don't seem to have. Like the tools that we've been using um, are not strong enough and sharp enough for the level of crisis that's happening. And we're all sort of, I think, bracing ourselves for um, the evolving mental health crisis that is coming because we all look whole and we're all still sitting at our computers and we're all still having these cheerful optimistic conversations but what's happening to us as social creatures is that we've been isolated in a way that is um, extremely damaging to the fabric of what makes our lives um, worth living and motivating and uplifting and all that stuff. So we are feeling the way that everyone else is. I wish I could say that we here in the mental health community have all the answers and we would love to tell you what they are. <laughs> but the reality is that um, this challenge is the biggest um, 
and possibly, you know, whatever most effective um, challenge that we've faced as a profession in what's really going to help the aggregate of suffering on the planet decrease and what we can do to help people to help themselves with that. And uh, in our scripture today, um, uh, it's basically the, the story of a woman who's experiencing this uncontrollable issue of blood. Um, and so, and Jesus kind of interjects. And so speaking of kind of working outside of the system, she had spent all this money and gone to all these physicians to try to address this issue that she was having. And ultimately Jesus was able to heal her, but what's powerful in the subtext of that story is uh, culturally at, at that time, like Levitical law said that if you were having an issue of blood and you were a woman, that meant that you were essentially socially ostracized. You couldn't go to the temple to worship. If anybody touched you, they were unclean. If you didn't touch a chair, you became unclean. So there was a sense that in the midst of your already difficult physical condition and, and disease that you're dealing with, now you're also socially separated and isolated from the people that you need ultimately to be made whole. And so you shared with me earlier just about the importance of kind of tribe and connection during this time yeah. more so than ever. Yeah, and you know, I think that um, in, in one of those clips that I sent you in prep for this, one of my friends, of an incredible writer named Johan Hari, whose books I recommend to everyone, and his TED Talk is just absolutely will reframe how we all look at addiction specifically. But, you know, as we all develop these maladaptive behavioral responses to the pain we're feeling, whether it's physical pain, emotional pain, like the woman in the scripture, um, there's only one thing that solves that, really and that is connection, um, connection with other people, meaningful, purpose-driven connection, community. We are social creatures. We have all been pushed into our homes and cut off from the greatest and most powerful source of healing that we have. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of research to support this. This isn't like a mystery. I don't think anybody's surprised to hear me say that connection is the answer. Um, but I think that one of the problematic things about how we're choosing to connect right now is that the internet gives us this illusion of connection. We're not actually getting the pings of real social validation that help our minds to process, um, you know, who we are, what we're doing on the planet, all these really critical existential and spiritual things that we get in interacting with others. And as people like the woman in the scripture suffer more, um, especially now, for some reason, it feels that our tendency to, is to do the opposite of what is most um, healing for us as individuals, not even for that person who's suffering, but it's to go within um, and to blame and to hide behind the rhetoric of whatever political movement we're part of. Or um, our, our inclinations, I think, have been a little bit twisted by this pandemic and this experience. And my my big sort of um, encouragement to everyone is to just try to find meaningful ways to connect and support, especially those who in, in individual ways, in one-on-one -on -one ways, like what we're doing right now. I had a conversation with a neighbor yesterday and we found ourselves so worked up emotionally with the joy of talking to one another that that became the topic of the conversation. It was like, we both realized how at first it was just a passing hello and then we lingered and then we like, came up with something else to talk about and continued. And I just said, I just wanna let you know that this is a really impactful and meaningful exchange in the middle of all of this loneliness. And he just laughed and we had this incredible moment of remembering that and how powerful that is and so whoever your your tribe is since we don't get to go into the loft which i look at behind you and get verklempt i miss it there so much um but really focusing on ways to inject those moments into our daily life Absolutely. And, and let's dig into that a little bit, because like you said, right now, there's a just mounting mental health kind of crisis wave. Uh, I'm sure there's strong spiritual parallels to that. That's, that's yeah. And in the midst of that, uh, sometimes our, our minds can lead us to think um, along the lines of like AA or the programs that have like a, 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 a approach that says it's all or nothing. Um, that yeah, some, no, that's so um, misleading. So in times like this, like you, you've emphasized the importance of like harm reduction. Uh, mitigation efforts that may not be able to solve the whole problem, but bring us towards home. So, I love your thoughts. On this. Yeah, yeah. So I think that one of the things that, if we're honest, we've watched everybody's maladaptive behavioral responses to pain increase, whether that's checking your phone 5,000 times a day or eating too many Cheetos in the middle of the night or over drinking or over consuming marijuana. This is something that I'm having people come to me all their time. They're 
their teenagers are really struggling. Um, and we're all trying to figure out, okay, well, what can I do to distract and decrease my own suffering? That is a normal human response to pain. What can I do? And we all develop these behaviors, some of them extremely acute, like serious drug addiction, some of them just pernicious and sort of shame-based and annoying, like the addiction to media or, or news or, um, you know, whatever. But um, one of the things that we do at Meta, um, the company that I run um, around mental health, is that we really, we, we celebrate this idea of harm reduction. It's not about, um, you know, some abstinence-based approach to anything. Like you, can, you have to check your phone, you have to eat food. Um, I believe that there is a place in, in modern life for all of the mind-altering substances in, if they're being used in a way that increases the experience, improves the experience of your life on the planet as opposed to destroying it in some way. And so one of the things that I do is I tell people, like if this is where you are, we'll use phone checking. It's a huge thing. <laughs> um, if, if you're checking your phone 5,000 times a day or 25,000 or whatever, no, you know what it is, but it's, we all know. Um, and, you, and you don't wanna be doing that. There's something in you that feels uncomfortable with that, that reaction to your pain and suffering and, and you want to change it, then the most important thing for you to do is tease apart your own inner voice from the outer noise come up with your own goal and just move toward it at whatever pace makes sense for you and then fall off the horse and then just get back on. But it needs to be your goal, especially if we're talking about alcohol and drugs, especially if we're talking about any kind of media addiction, especially, no, not especially anything, with everything. It is important for you to go inward Stop listening to your mom. Stop listening to your church. Stop listening to the media. Decide what lines up with your value system and just start to move toward that because already in identifying your own inner truth around whatever that is, you've reduced the harm of being clueless about where you're trying to go. And it makes it a lot more successful. We've noticed a lot with, with um, people who struggle with substance use disorder, whether it's alcohol or other things that this approach to allowing an individual to have agency in their own goal setting and in the pace of reaching that goal, our outcomes are completely different. It is so radically different than telling people, oh, we know you're, you're hurting and things are really hard and it's a pandemic and so you should not do any of the things that help you to feel relief. You should just give all of those up. And so our approach, you know, is totally the opposite of that. It's let's just figure out what you're getting from it and figure out if there's another way to get that that isn't so problematic. And let's figure out where you want to go and we'll help you get there, which is really, I, I, I love it. It's what's ch changed and saved my personal life and many people I know. And what you're describing, they're like just alternative approaches. Like there's like this kind of standard way that you're supposed to do things. And even if you look at this, this story with Jesus, like Jesus basically took an alternative approach. This woman had gone to every standard traditional approach to reach her healing. And Jesus, I mean, it's funny. I read a book called Waking the Tiger this week about kind of how to handle trauma that, that Ashley Matoyer recommended this week. And I was reading through that and I was surprised how closely Jesus actually did that moment matched a shamanic practice of kind of how you how one would approach communal healing so yeah curious is, is you think about like alternative modalities to help alternative resources to help people kind of process through this time what comes to mind yeah and i you know i love that you that you bring up jesus here in this church conversation because i feel really inspired by um the radical and rebellious nature of christ and all of his actions and and not being afraid or maybe being afraid because i'm afraid. I'm afraid to speak out about what I do and what my path has been because right now in our culture, um, it is misperceived as something it's not. And as, a, as someone who uses psychedelics um, to do trauma healing, both in, in line with the protocols that are being put out by the FDA, but also in a totally shamanic ceremonial setting down in Mexico where we're opening a center, um, I have had to grapple with the fear of being a rebel um, and the judgment around that. But what I do, what saved my life as a total skeptic was going into a shamanic ceremonial healing um, session in Mexico many years ago and having an experience with a psychedelic medicine called ayahuasca um, that completely opened my mind to things that were possible 
subconsciously and in my heart and in my spiritual life and with my family and with my career that I had never before even been aware of. And since then, I became much more interested in and began um, training with um, people down in Oaxaca, up in the mountains, and in Teotihuacan, and in Central America, and with and this beautiful community of healers who have these outcomes that are totally undocumented because it's an oral tradition, and these are ceremonial practices. And I became truly obsessed with figuring out how to make these healing modalities available to people like my brother who died of a drug overdose. And I really feel, you know, you can speculate all day, I can what if all day, but I believe that if my brother had not been sent to rehab and been given these messages about having a disease and that his brain was broken and that he was always going to be addicted and he would never be able to have a safe relationship with any substance ever, these messages really changed how he saw himself and redefined the possibilities that he had in his life in a way that limited him so totally that he never really fully became a person. It's like he just got smashed into this label and it became him. And, um, and so for me, my, my career and many of my church friends will be surprised to hear this because they think I do other things because I've been keeping this quiet for quite some time has been really to commit my whole life to making psychedelic healing um, better understood from a research and academic standpoint. I do a lot of advocacy and a lot of um, partnership with people who are pushing the research as well as just accessible to people whose healing process demands this level of intervention. And that's not everyone. I want to be clear that these modalities are not for everyone and that anybody who's practicing psychedelic healing should not be making it available without a long-term healing process in place that that is one component of. And um, what I've seen as a result of this commitment and my years and years of training and work is that people's, I mean, cry, people's lives get saved. I've watched um, my own life and the lives of many people who I've gotten to work with um, completely change track, completely change track in a way that I would have not believed was possible without these radical gifts from Mother Earth that our people have been using um, in these very sacred spiritual traditions for thousands and thousands of years. The power of that to sit in circle or to sit with an individual and administer a medicine that has never been touched by a pharmaceutical company and is not being profited on and watch it transform the mind of a person is just unbelievable. Becca, that's powerful. And uh, as people think about kind of resources and how to move forward, uh, thought, thoughts for folks about kind of where they can go from here? Yeah, I mean, two things. I think that it's really important to just try to get away from the noise and listen to what it is you're actually seeking. Because it's, you know, you can go out and start doing research and like pulling studies and reading books and listening to podcasts, but that can be part of the same unproductive busyness that <laughs> that is characterizing your unrest anyway. But I'm available to have a conversation with anybody if they're curious. I also point everybody toward the science writer, Michael Pollan, who um, wrote a book called How to Change Your Mind, which really investigates a lot of the psychedelic modalities that we use. And um, then my, my company is called Meta Holistic Mental Health. And we have a website that I'm not going to say because I'll bungle it. You can call me and I'll, and I'll tell you how to get there. <laughs> so we're going to break into small groups now. We'll give you a prompt in just a second. Look forward to processing through exactly what you said. But thanks so much for joining and opening this story and opportunity. Thanks a lot, Terrence. It was my pleasure. Josh Lopez Ray is here, he, him, his. Thanks again for being with us today. If you would like to stay connected with the events happening in the community or perhaps one of our groups that is currently meeting online throughout the week, please visit theloftla.org. And please support this work. If you uh, found it helpful, please share it with others who might find it to be a blessing. Another way that you can support if you're able to is by giving online and you can also do so by checking out the giving tab on the website so as we leave this space today may you dare to be brave may you know that you belong and may you remember that you are loved peace <laughs>